In an effort to combat climate change, various government agencies have implemented regulations to reduce greenhouse gases and to protect our ozone layer. Part of these efforts include removing environmentally harmful refrigerants used in commercial and industrial applications that include food retailers such as supermarkets, membership stores, convenience stores, drug stores, dollar stores, and distribution centers. These regulations can be hard to understand and can change a lot over time. Many companies don't even know these regulations exist, much less how to comply. So, what do people need to know? Hill Phoenix has been in the refrigeration industry for over 100 years and is an expert in both synthetic and natural refrigerants. I'm here today with Sean Daly, product manager for Hill Phoenix, to help explain the regulatory landscape. Sean, we all want to do our part to make the world a better place, but from a refrigeration and a regulation standpoint, which agencies are leading the charge against climate change? So, Grady, I think you could probably break the regulatory agencies down into three buckets. At a federal level, you've got the US EPA with their SNAP regulations. Now those were delisted, but they're coming back around due to AIM or the American Innovations and Manufacturing Act. The more regionalized level, you've got the US Climate Alliance. Most recently, you may have heard that Governor Jay Inslee from Washington State signed a bill that essentially empowers the Washington Department of Ecology to regulate refrigerants based on their GWPs. Uh, then you've got California with their new CARB regulations. Those are some pretty strict targets that are taking effect in January 1st of 2022. Well, the EPA SNAP regulations seek to advance the evaluation and eventual adoption of alternatives to ozone depleting substances like your traditional HCFC refrigerants to reduce the impact on human health, to improve the environment, and are intended to make the switch over to safer options easier for users. For example, SNAP focuses on ozone depleting HCFC hydrochlorofluorocarbons like R22, which is traditionally the most widely used compound in refrigerant blends and has a global warming potential of 1,810 versus, for instance, CO2, which has a GWP of one. And in 2020, SNAP regulations banned the production and importation of HCFCs R22 and R142B. So basically after 2020, servicing systems containing R22 is going to require the use of either recycled or stockpiled refrigerants. That's going to make it fairly difficult and expensive to keep these systems running. And there's another regulation that focuses on cold storage warehouses specifically. Effectively, that regulation prohibits the use of R404A and R507A. And finally, by 2030, SNAP aims to delist or ban all HCFC refrigerants completely. As a reminder that enforcement of these new regulations are not something to be taken lightly, you should know that the federal government has imposed fines on many retailers, from large to small, regional to national, tens of millions of dollars in the past decade alone. So how will store owners know which refrigerant to use going forward? Grady, the EPA has developed 23 rules, a lot of which pertain to refrigeration. They've compiled a list of acceptable alternative refrigerants as well as restrictions and applications for those refrigerants. If you're really interested in seeing regulations as written, uh, you could visit their website and view the actual rules and lists. But I would caution that the rules themselves can be a little bit overwhelming as they do cover quite a few applications. More recently, we've seen CARB bring a renewed focus to eco-friendly refrigerants. Although CARB's jurisdiction is in California, oftentimes they blaze a trail and set the standard that other states will eventually follow. CARB sets standards and it promotes the adoption of innovative solutions to reduce greenhouse gas emissions. California's typically led the way in advancing innovations that go on to become the standard across the country for improving air quality and reducing the threat of climate change. To date, CARB regulations on commercial refrigeration include no refrigerants with a GWP greater than 150 can be used in new stationary refrigeration systems containing more than 50 pounds of refrigerant. This rule represents a significant change from today and goes into effect January of 2022. 
CARB recently secured legislation to reduce the risk of environmental impact by regulating what they refer to as weighted average GWP. GWP is a refrigerant's potential to accumulate in the atmosphere and trap radiant heat from the sun. You might also have heard of refrigerants with a high GWP referred to as greenhouse gases. CARB has set a target to reduce the potential for greenhouse gas emissions from food retailers by requiring them to reduce the proportion of high GWP refrigerants in their stores. We break down the current CARB regulations into two groups. In the first group, companies that own or operate 20 or more facilities with refrigeration systems containing more than 50 pounds of refrigerant. They're required to meet a target of 1400 GWP average or a 55% greenhouse gas emission potential reduction, as well as an interim target of 2,500 GWP average, or a 25% GHGP reduction by 2030. The second group is made up of companies who own or operate less than 20 facilities with refrigeration systems containing more than 50 pounds of refrigerant. They need to meet a 1,400 GWP average or a 55% GHGP reduction by the end of the decade. There is no interim target for this second group of retailers. It's important to note that the GHGP targets are calculated based on their 2018 levels as a benchmark. You can see what kind of challenges businesses could face meeting these new CARB targets. And then we have the U.S. Climate Alliance another organization that's been expediting the implementation of new regulations at the state level elsewhere in the country. Well, from its start in 2017, the U.S. Climate Alliance has been committed to reducing greenhouse gas emissions and has set policies and moved legislation forward to fight climate change. When you've got a bipartisan coalition of 25 governors covering half the U.S. population, and 11.7 trillion in economic activity. Their efforts and commitment to tracking and reporting their progress and facilitating new and existing policies that reduce emissions and promote clean energy can be impactful. I agree. The U.S. Climate Alliance has been proposing policies aimed at attaining the goals of the Paris Agreement, which seeks to reduce greenhouse gas emissions by at least 25% below 2005 levels by the year 2025. Governors that are engaged with the organization are driving their respective states to meet their own timelines and reduction targets. These regulations sound like they're very complex and got a lot of moving parts. How should retailers go about complying with these rules? At this point, companies should seek out as much information as possible to make an informed decision. It's entirely possible that achieving compliance by the deadline could require a lot of time and effort, so this really isn't something to procrastinate on. You definitely don't want to risk missing something or making a mistake. I would strongly recommend talking with an industry expert if you need help deciphering the regulations or coming up with an action plan. Can you give us an example of what an action plan might look like? Sure. Let's take CARB compliance for a retailer with less than 20 stores as a starting point, since it's the simplest case. To make this as clear as possible, I'll just use rounded numbers. These aren't exact values, but they're representative. If that retailer has 10 sites with 1,000 pounds of R404A and R404A has a GWP of 3,900, then the weighted average for that retailer is simply 3,900. In order to be compliant, they could retrofit seven of their stores to CO2, which has a GWP of one. That would get them to a weighted average of approximately 1,170 GWP. Alternatively, they could convert every single one of their stores to a refrigerant like R448A, which has a GWP of roughly 1300, making their weighted average GWP roughly 1300. So by converting to CO2 or retrofitting to a lower GWP refrigerant are the only ways to be compliant? Well, there's a middle ground that's a combination of retrofits and conversions. The math is a little less straightforward here, but at a high level, the retailer from my previous example could retrofit five stores with CO2 and convert three stores to R448A. That would net them a weighted average GWP slightly below 1200. So there are a lot of different ways to slice this, and as you might have noticed, it can get pretty complicated fairly quickly. It's one of the reasons that we've been developing tools to help establish a baseline and implement an action plan here at Hill Phoenix. 
give us a call and we'd be happy to help make sense of the regulations and get you started on your path to compliance. At the end of the day, it's not a matter of if retailers need to comply with regulations, but when they need to comply. And 2030 is just around the corner. Sean, thank you for your time. If you have any questions about refrigeration regulation or want more information, please contact us at info at hillphoenix.com or call us at 770-285-3264 or visit our website, hillphoenix.com.